In London today, thousands marched from Parliament to Trafalgar Square, calling for gender equality, an end to sexual harassment, and to celebrate a century since Britain first gave women the vote. The march comes four days ahead of International Women's Day. The British women who fought so hard to secure the right to vote in 1918 were called suffragettes. In tonight's Dispatch from London, Nala Ayed takes us back to the future as she looks at how far women have come and the struggle still ahead. Emmeline Pankhurst, a name that in the land of the suffragettes always had a solid place in history. They who literally had to fight for the women's right to vote never quite forgot. But a hundred years later, forgotten enough, let's say, that they're conspicuous in their presence, brought back to life by a new cohort of fighters, including a great granddaughter who still carries the Pankhurst name. Little did I know that actually now, in 2018, the resonance of so many of the issues are just incredible. And the resonance is people saying, enough. For today's battles for equality, the story of the suffragettes makes a powerful backdrop. The marches, the violence and clashes with police, and Pankhurst's own arrest, deeds, not words, as she called them, in the name of a vote they believed would unlock many other rights women were denied. Like there is the potential. In this anniversary year, the fight has flared up, but the deeds have evolved. Britain's Me Too moment, reaching into the heart of British democracy, where one in five people say they've been sexually harassed this year. The lasting inequities, reaching into the heart of that other most British of institutions. The great helmsman. So when a senior correspondent left a BBC job in China over a pay gap with male colleagues, many others spoke out for the first time. You know, one of the reasons why, why I decided to speak out is that I thought it was really time that we did shine a light on, on this issue. I have had, you know, a very successful career. Um, my partner has been the one who gave up his job and stayed at home with the children. Um, I've had a life, you know, which women 100 years ago couldn't have dreamed of. But I think some of the ingrained cultural beliefs that have existed for thousands of years um, will take longer to break down. A hundred years later, it may be useful to imagine what Pankhurst would think of all this coinciding with the anniversary of the first suffragette victory. I think she'd be appalled. I think she'd be angry. There are so many areas where we still have that fight to fight and it isn't a single line. So it isn't the police versus um, the suffragettes. It's now in so many forms. So it's, we have the fight in parliament to get equal representation. We have the fight at work to get equal pay. We have the fight at home to have um, men and women valued equally. There are still timely lessons in the old battle lines tucked away in the folds of British history. Behold Suffragetto, a board game that immortalizes the standoff between suffragettes and the police. And this, believed the only existing complete set. Where they want to be is the House of Commons, um, as, as voters and ultimately as MPs. Designed by Pankhurst, British Women's Social and Political Union as propaganda for the cause. Resurrected now for an exhibition, a reminder of how to take on the barriers. It's inspiring, actually, because what it does show you is that, yes, some things haven't changed, but some things have. Change can be slow, but it does happen. So I think it's come at a really good time to remind us that we're not the first to have these problems, that feminism is still important, and that we can engage with it in intellectual terms as well as in activist terms. Lessons, too, in the Royal Albert Hall, known for its grand concerts, it still echoes suffragette slogans. Only by selling all the tickets to these meetings that they could really show that they meant business. Their meetings would have been something. Thousands of women crammed in here with lessons in the importance of deeds to their cause, not just words. 
they used to pass around um, buckets and they used to, into that, they could put in either checks or they could put in jewellery, which a lot of them did. So we know that people took off brooches, they took off hat pins, there were necklaces, there were bracelets, and there were even wedding rings. It is here that Emmeline Pankhurst first called on women to fight. She was saying, go out and do whatever you can. If you can disrupt meetings, then disrupt them. If you can smash things, smash them. If you can burn things, burn them. The shackles that bind us, they are the same. It was a difficult, violent chapter in British history that now lives on by other, more peaceful means. I want to hear you cheer. But in the land of the suffragettes, a hundred years later, a question grows louder. Just how much longer until equal pay, equal opportunity, freedom from harassment and assault? Pankhurst has written an old family prescription. What's needed, she says, are deeds, not words. That what the suffragettes would be saying is keep forward, keep going, there's, there's still work to be done. And so, generations later, the marches go on. March together! March together! Nala Ayed, CBC News, London. Britain wasn't the first country to grant women the vote. New Zealand, in fact, granted that right a quarter century earlier in 1893. In Canada, women in Manitoba were the first to get the franchise in 1916. But it wasn't until 1960, under Prime Minister John Diefenbaker, that First Nations women, and men for that matter, could take part in federal elections. The most recent country to allow women to vote, Saudi Arabia. It was only in late 2015 that women there could cast their votes for the very first time.